What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health, an affiliate of Mad in America Radio, broadcasting on KBOO in Oregon, sponsored by Portland Hearing Voices and the Icarus Project, and syndicated on the Pacifica Network. Madness Radio is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio and at madinamerica.com. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Martha Sneed. Martha works in the UK National Health Service in the front line of mental health care. She survived a psychotic breakdown after a journey with the psychedelic drug ayahuasca. And today, she is co-director of an interdisciplinary research team in Bristol, UK, and is studying transpersonal psychology and consciousness. So welcome to Madness Radio, Martha Sneed. Thanks for having me, Will. I'm really excited about our conversation. Yeah, the intersection of shamanism, mental health crisis, and what gets called psychosis, and then also psychedelic drugs is very interesting and very topical today. There's a lot of people getting more and more interested in so many of the things that we're hearing from the research about psychedelic medicine. And I also am very interested in speaking with you because uh, you work really as a bridge builder. You're both someone who has survived a psychotic breakdown, a psychotic experience. You've survived hospitalization as a mental patient, and you also are working today as a clinician. So building the bridges and being able to bring those perspectives together is very powerful. So welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. I think it is bridge building and it's challenging to have both of those identities as a way. And um, I'm learning all the time. Now, do your colleagues in the National Health Service, do they know that you have um, survived hospitalization and been through a psychotic breakdown yourself? Is that something that you're out about and that you bring into your work openly? It always is at the beginning of an interview. And it's what I lead with because it's it's how I know what I know and it's what I'm passionate about. But um, before working in the NHS, I was a support worker where my team was about six people and now it's about 60. And so this time around, I decided not to just go in and have it be the first thing that I say to every single person, but rather kind of feel my way through and allow people to get to know me and who I am for who I am. And then as and when I feel comfortable with individual people, I might talk about things in varying depth. To be totally honest, my experience in the NHS when I first started was not one of feeling safe to disclose. And I I actually changed teams so that I could be working with particular clinicians that I knew were far more progressive and compassionate and forward thinking. What was it about disclosing that didn't feel safe to you? The way that patients were spoken about, to be totally honest, it felt degrading And I I think that much of the time it's completely unintentional and it's a way for people to deal with their own discomfort with that situation or the pain that it touches in themselves. When we don't want to touch that discomfort, we other it, right? We we push it away and say we want to distance ourselves from those people that are bringing up that level of discomfort in, in us. So you would see that with the clinicians. The clinicians would be uncomfortable and then they would use a degrading kind of way of speaking without even realizing it. Yeah, absolutely. What are some examples of that? Because safety in a workplace and feeling degraded, I mean, these are very, very strong experiences that clinicians really need to understand more because the, anybody that you meet, even if they don't disclose right up front, they could have this history. They could have had something that they went through or someone in their family. Exactly, and that's why it was so heartbreaking to to feel like that that wasn't really being acknowledged and to assume that just because you work in mental health services, you you haven't had any of the experiences. One example would be in my induction, I was working and I heard a patient referred to as it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really know how to handle that. This was a clinician who referred to another patient as, as it, as an object. Yeah. Yeah. Degrading and dehumanizing, but it's quite hard to call out in the moment because um, it kind of, it's like you're eavesdropping on their conversation. You can't just barge in and say like, Hey, I don't think, I don't think what you said there was okay. Or so it's sometimes not always possible to, to bring it up. And it feels more just like this implicit assumption that we as staff are better than the patients. They are less, they are not part of what we are. They are separate. 
so that was really heavy to have my experiences and then be in that environment that felt like that and like there wasn't even enough space to formulate the kinds of questions at the kind of level that I wanted to be thinking at there wasn't that space within the team that I was in so I moved (laughs) to Mm -hmm. a a really great team that um, has been so inspiring and open-minded totally different experience that's what we're seeing in, in the US and I think around the world is that there are changes happening, but at very uneven rates. So there might be one small group of people or one agency or one ward, which has a more progressive or more open attitude, whereas others, you may have less, or there may be conflicts or differences within different tendencies within a specific agency or workplace. Like postcode really will dictate how somebody is essentially treated from, it could range from being very medical model to I mean in Bristol being really thought about in a totally different way and attempted to be held trauma-informed care is one that's coming through is that coming through in the U.S.? It is trauma-informed care and recovery approaches are both growing but it's like you say it's it's uneven it may depend on the zip code the region that you're you're in it also sounds like identifying yourself as a patient as the first thing can become kind of a box it sort of limits your participation or the perception of the totality of what you you have to offer yeah it was an experiment really I just wanted to feel my own way into the job you know it's going to be potentially more helpful for people having gotten to know me as me and then having um like oh wow like so you properly went mad and now you're in this place and you're doing this stuff and okay well that changes my perception of you know what I thought psychosis was or what people could go on to do after having a breakdown so that's, that's, I guess, like part of the process is allowing people to form their own opinions and then, um, and then revealing, revealing more as I feel comfortable with them as well. It's, I think feeling safe is important. Yeah, I have a similar experience. and It is a bit disconcerting when people don't know your background. You, you can get some of the behind the scenes talk and then they'll maybe say things or express an attitude that they certainly wouldn't have if they were on their best behavior because they knew who was listening. So yeah, I guess it's kind of sneaky in a way (laughs) (laughs) undercover. (laughs) And this is something that's happening very much in the UK national health service. It's also happening in the United States where people with experience of being in psychiatric hospitals, having a psychotic breakdown, going mad, getting a diagnosis perhaps of schizophrenia or bipolar are then afterwards valued for that and then given a job because of that experience as a peer worker. So tell us about how you got involved in the mental health system to begin with. We, we mentioned earlier that your, your break or your big crisis came as a result of, of taking uh, the psychedelic um, ayahuasca. But let's maybe talk about how, what the buildup was to that. How, how did that happen? Because it wasn't just the psychedelic, it sounds like there were many, many different things that went into this experience that you had. So how did you kind of get into the mental health system to begin with? Yeah, so there was definitely things that led up to it. One of which is that I was living in Colombia from the age of 21 for two years. And I was over there because I was fascinated by and heartbroken by the the civil conflict. And I really was wanting to do a form of kind of grassroots human rights activism really I was really interested in working with displaced communities communities of people that had been affected by the conflict and I was aiming to do that through writing a blog and giving them a platform I was kind of obsessed with (laughs) Colombian politics and was exposing myself indirectly to a lot of brutality really wanting to pull the wool off of my eyes that I felt I had been in, in a, in a bubble in the UK. I really just wanted to see the human condition a little clearer. And so I really was quite wrapped up in this dream or this identity of, of wanting to make an impact and do something. And gradually over time, I realized that these communities don't need someone writing a blog about them they need human rights lawyers they need people that have the expertise and the power to actually take the practical steps when I realized that I wasn't going to be able to stay out there and do all of those things when that collapsed a part of my identity also broke down because I I had immersed myself in the identity as activist as person doing this thing and then when I couldn't do the thing 
there was like a huge opening that happened and I've got it documented in my journals and it's basically a void it's it's discovering a space inside me where before I just hadn't felt any and it was through that loss I guess that loss of identity or that loss of a dream that really introduced me or initiated me into the first stages of a deeper inquiry into what life was about into a deeper inquiry of who I was so this was going on in the lead up before I did ayahuasca these big questions this first steps into self-inquiry and meditation what did I write in my journal I think I said something like I don't understand what this is but I know that it's more real than anything I've known before and it was just that tapping into something transpersonal essentially and those transpersonal experiences I think I've come to understand them as the stepping stones that led me from the shore of sanity you could say to the to the other side I think if I hadn't had that that awakening and that process of my reality changing I don't think that ayahuasca would have had quite as deep or um, intense impact on me I think they were a part of me losing it but I also think those transpersonal experiences and spirituality and meditation have been the stepping stones back to the shore of sanity as well so you had an identity where you were in Colombia um, wanting to contribute just through being there and, and working with displaced communities. But but then you kind of stepped back from that and, and felt that, wait, I can't really help in the way that I expected to. And then your identity kind of opens up. And then in that opening of, whoa, is it, is it something like, who am I? What am I here for? What is the meaning of life? Did you start to explore this this kind of gap in your identity from a meditation standpoint where you're reading spiritual books where you're sort of seeing it as a possibility of some kind of spiritual opening it wasn't my choice to see it as a spiritual opening it was just an opening and it was like a gap like you say just touching into something that didn't really have any content but was vast and vibrant and it felt bigger than me it felt beyond who I had known myself to be previously. And you intuitively knew to trust it. You, you said, wait a second, this is something really important. I have to follow this. I have to really pay attention. How did you know to trust that? Because for a lot of people, I think that would be very um, frightening and they would not want to just not have an identity and open themselves to this gap. They would quickly grab at some new identity or just stay with their old identity. What is it in you that led you to kind of trust that part of yourself? Yeah, that's a really good question. I haven't, I haven't thought about it before, but I think the fact that the identity that I'd lost, I'd invested so much in it and it was so fully gone that I didn't, I couldn't scrape it back. I couldn't reconcile myself. I was distraught. Like I'd moved over to Colombia fully intending to live there for the rest of my life and be an activist. Like it was a proper dream and it had really crumbled. And so I think at that point, I was desperate enough to trust this deeper sense. And, and I think I trusted it because it felt, it just felt true. It felt, it felt uh, right, I guess. You've described what you went through as a calling and an initiation. Do you think that maybe somehow at a deeper level of your, of your mind or your soul or your spirit, you knew to kind of trust it because you could feel this was part of that calling or part of that initiation, even though you couldn't sort of think of it consciously? Yeah, I think maybe I was just maybe I was just ready, maybe I was just ripe to look a little deeper. I think part of me had always been wanting to adventure into life. Like I'd always been very adventurous and I think it was just another, another way of traveling. So rather than traveling, you know, to a different country, I was traveling through my mind more and maybe I was just ready to take that step. And is that when you had the opportunity to do the ayahuasca? Yeah, so it kind of coincided. It was about six months after that that my cousin suggested it and she came over to Colombia and actually did it with me. And so for people who maybe don't know that much about ayahuasca, what was it that you learned about it and that led you to say, okay, I'm going to give this a try? I think what led me to give it a try was my slightly reckless, adventurous spirit. (laughs) That's just how I'm wired, I think, or how I have been, how I was wired, at least. And I understood that it was a hallucinogenic plant medicine 
that is used um, and has been used for millennia in the countries that it's native to in Latin America. And I was living in Latin America. I was also quite drawn to shamanism. There was something about it that really resonated. So I was really excited to have the chance to do it. But unfortunately, I was only six months into a journey with self-inquiry and really looking deeper. So my my understanding of where I was and what I was ready for, I think, was limited. So I went into the ayahuasca with an intention that was looking back quite foolish and quite reckless that was really just about letting go completely destroying the ego all of that stuff that on the surface spirituality can sometimes mislead people to think that's what it's about and so I went in with that intention and and the experience was I think very strong because of that yeah that's always been very confusing to me that there's this um valuing like we were supposed to get rid of our egos we're supposed to destroy our egos are supposed to surrender beyond our egos. Well, actually, if you've been through a psychotic experience, you might need a little bit more ego. Getting rid of your ego isn't isn't very fun if it's completely overwhelming and totally renders you unable to function and brings all the suffering that that's associated. So I think there's a real simplistic sort of framing of what a spiritual process is. And, and for you, it was um, kind of like a, a recklessness, a kind of like a foolish jump into something that turned out to be way bigger than you expected exactly yeah and I think you're it's such an important point that you're making about the sense of self and that relation to psychosis and there's interesting research about that you know if if you haven't got a strong stable sense of self if that sense of self is maybe more permeable or boundaries have been broken in some way then doing something like ayahuasca you're probably likely to have a stronger more extreme experience because that boundary between yourself and a wider reality whatever that may be is is already more permeable so you're potentially more likely to to cross that threshold and and not be able to find your way back so easily or straight away Yeah, it can be a very powerful emotional experience. And there is a lot of research about how strong emotional experiences can be part of the ingredients that lead to people having breaks. Um, It may not necessarily be specific to psychedelics. I mean, there's an association between going off to college and having a, a psychotic break. There's an association between having your first big, love a romantic breakup being associated so there's something about the intensity of these emotional experiences that as you say maybe if someone is more permeable or more sensitive or isn't quite as grounded as other people that overwhelm might take on something much bigger than they expected but it sounds like you didn't really have any previous experience with the mental health system so no one was kind of telling you you know stay away from psychedelics because you've got Uh, psychosis in your personal history you were just at a very vulnerable place in in your life it sounds like yeah I think I was feeling the effects of living in a culture that I no longer knew what my part was to play I'd had this kind of identity crisis I guess I think things like that they just built up I like to understand the psychotic process in the way that John Weir Perry does, which is the psyche's way of radically reorganizing the self with a capital S and what may look like a fragmented and chaotic state, if allowed to resolve itself, can actually be a regenerative process. You mentioned witnessing and being um, close to some of the brutality that happened in Colombia when you were there, do you think that maybe you had some trauma or some kind of traumatic experiences that hadn't really been processed or addressed or or taken care of? And that was one of the things that contributed to being so permeable, as you say, and so sensitive to the psychedelic uh, drug trip that you went on to take? Yeah, I think so, because I had always been quite a resilient and grounded teenager and young adult I think seeking out and investigating so much into such a a violent country and really wanting to kind of put myself into that situation in a way and document it definitely contributed. I don't think I really knew 
at the time the, the effect that it was having on my psyche. But I think it I think it probably did have an effect. And I want to ask you about the experience and what happened taking the ayahuasca, but maybe we should just take a step back. Are you someone who now where you're at with your experience, are you now saying everyone should stay away from psychedelics and ayahuasca? Are you saying that everyone, are you saying that anyone who has any fear or concern about a psychotic break or a big crisis should stay away? Or where is your sort of caution now looking back on the experience? Yeah, I think um, we can't really use a generalized approach for this because everyone's experience is so different. Even in moment to moment, it's all an accumulation of past experience, worldview, culture. So everyone is going to experience whatever they do completely differently. So I'm certainly not saying that everyone should stay away from ayahuasca because I actually, my perspective on my journey now is that the medicine gave me what I needed and it was a, and it was a journey and that I still feel the medicine of ayahuasca in my learning now. Um, I just think it was quite a hard lesson that I had to go through of being humbled. So I think that ayahuasca will give you what you ask for and um, I wasn't really aware of what I was asking for. And so I, I don't think that people should, you know, not use it anymore. But I do think that it's slightly whitewashed, I guess, in, in terms of the effects that it can have. And there is a dark side to it. There's also a dark side to its commodification and, and the abuse of power that practitioners or shamans or whoever it is that are holding the space that is um, a, a massive issue with the war on drugs and the attitudes that we have towards psychedelic drugs things get so simplistic it's always black or white it's either people who are strongly in favor who think that psychedelic medicine is the answer to all mental health problems who think that ayahuasca is all you know the solution to curing everything that ails you in your mind body Spirit, And then you have the other side, which is that these are dangerous, stay away, it's all. And actually, the reality is, is uh, somewhere in between. I think a harm reduction approach is important because we could say that, well, you know, you kind of had the worst case scenario, which is that you, you jumped into taking ayahuasca, you had a psychotic break, what would get called a psychotic break, it, it met that clinical diagnostic criteria, and then you end up in a psych hospital, it's one of the worst things that could happen. But actually, it wasn't so black and white for you because it had this positive side to it and may have been part of what you needed or something that was useful. You said something that, that it gives you what you need. And I think that that's a very powerful stance, not to just say dive in and it always is the right thing to do, but more like an attitude of, well, whatever's coming, whatever the difficulty I'm having is, it is within my capacity to handle it. It is within my ability to make it through and to get something positive about this. And this is a general attitude towards any kind of adversity, which can be very beneficial, whether you're dealing with the loss of someone you love or the um, some illness that you're facing or losing your, your job. And, and I think that you had a strong attitude to hold on to and make it through your experience, it, it sounds like. And maybe you didn't quite know that you had that until you got into it because it sounds like your intention was your intention when you went in was like, I want to blow up my ego. I want to transcend. I want to just break through the self. What was it that you were setting as an intention going in? All of that transcendental kind of unbalanced understanding of what I thought spirituality was about, which was complete detachment and letting go of, of my humanness, letting go of... I don't know. I don't really know. I just knew that I wanted to go in and I wanted to go hard. <laughs> Which is not a recommended attitude to take towards anything maybe in, in life. I don't know, especially something as risky or as, as unpredictable, we should say, as psychedelic drugs. And you mentioned misuses of power. And what about the people who were doing this, who were guiding or presenting or facilitating the ayahuasca session that you did? How do you see that looking back now? That's been a real journey of changing perception as well. I felt quite traumatized by the way that the space was held and the way that I was treated. And there wasn't um, enough communication or consensual agreement to what was happening to me at all. It's been a real journey of seeing that actually they were probably just doing the best that they could in the moment, which is what we're all doing, whether we know it or not. We're all kind of bumbling our way through life, even if it means that we do end up 
harming others. Are these were indigenous um, guides and healers or mestizo Colombians, or who was it who was leading this? The lead shaman was a mestizo Colombian who was very young. He was only 29, which is incredibly young for a for someone to have that status. And then there was a grandfather who was part of a, I guess, a a lineage of of healers. And this younger shaman wasn't related to them, but he was through his, I think he had a dream at a young age that he was kind of connected to this elder. And then there was a, there was a couple of like facilitators in the space who were from the States. So on the surface, you know, it looked like it had all the ingredients to be well held. Well, this is a reminder to us to not romanticize that just because someone is from a, the country that you're in or someone has a lineage to some indigenous source, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not also human and then they may have a shadow side, or they may have uh, failings or limitations, or they may just have face all the different kinds of things that, you know, all humans do. There's a tremendous romanticization that happens of the indigenous shaman world. And we think we need to definitely value what is tremendously, incredibly wise in those traditions, but at at the same time, not lose our skepticism or our sense that these are also human beings. And I would say that the other side is true as well. Some people would say, well, look, you know, you go off to Latin America, you go with the unlicensed, unsupervised community folk grassroots experience, yeah, of course, that's going to be dangerous. So what we need is we need people who are going into clinics, into hospitals, who go with an MD or a licensed psychotherapist or psychiatrist. Well, I think that there are many, many dangers of that as well, that that we can romanticize and we can put our power and, and trust in medical authorities unwisely as well. And even though a lot of the reports that we're seeing in psychedelic medicine are very enthusiastic and positive and showing these tremendous results. My sense of it is it's really exaggerated and the risks of working with medical professionals professionals are also great. Psychotherapists can misuse their power. They do misuse their power. And just because you're in some kind of official trial or eventually as psychedelic medicine becomes more widely available, it doesn't mean that the risks have gone down because you're in a medicalized uh, context, because there is that false trust and that false hope that can often be projected and put on um, authorities. So we have to be very cautious about this from all different perspectives, I think. Absolutely. And you've named it by speaking about power. In the spiritual community, we see more and more now so many so called gurus being exposed, you know, as abusers. So, so, you know, shamanic practitioners aren't immune to that potential downfall as humans we all you know we all have those shadow aspects in our psyche that might um, abuse status or even unconsciously be working in a in a way that isn't beneficial and it's really interesting that you compare it to the medicalization of psychedelics and and how that all works because that's still really like a ceremonial ritual as well right you know we go the, the the doctors are seen as the in the same way that shamans are just through our western lens and you know we go to the appointment and they've they've got the outfit they've got the the pill they've got the medicine and they've got the they've got the special language very exotic yeah, spells that they cast and they have strange implements they don't have a rattle but they have their um you know functional mri images and their descriptions of chemicals but it's still this mystification of human experience which kind of casts a spell over you it's like a ceremony yeah, and yet they totally abstract the individual's subjective experience by basing their knowledge based on conceptual categories and needing to conquer and know exactly what's going on. You know, this desire amongst orthodox science to just have everything figured out and we've got the box for everything. And Which also spiritual practitioners can do as well. They have their theology, they have their system, they are diagnosing auras instead of chemical imbalances, but they are convinced that they're right. And I think the common pitfall is that you lose the subjective valuing of listening to the person and connecting with the person as a diverse, unique person that may fit some of your expectations, but may also not fit some of your expectations. And so you have to be open to the individual as an individual, whether it's a spiritual context or a medical context or anywhere in life. 
Totally. And I think that's what really interesting about the spiritual emergency model within transpersonal psychology is it's kind of being hit from both sides. The transpersonal community wants to create this criteria where only some experiences are spiritual enough to be deemed a spiritual emergency. And if you don't tick enough of them, you know, then you're just mad. And then you've got the other side of these experiences being hit by the medical model as being completely devoid of meaning. And so transformation is an incredibly complex and nuanced process. And I'm really interested in kind of understanding a little bit more about how or what makes a crisis transformative particularly manic states like what is it that can facilitate lasting positive impact so what happened with your ayahuasca journey was it one journey that you did or how did it kind of develop into a psychotic experience I was on a week's retreat where we did several ceremonies And even before I drank ayahuasca for the first time, I was having this intense energetic experience um, in my like in my arms. I had to I had to go lie down and have someone um, look after me for a little bit. I wasn't doing anything bizarre. I was just letting them know that I was having a really intense experience. And I remember actually that this healer from Colombia, I was lying down and feeling really weirded out. And she said to me in Spanish, you're going to have many gifts. And I didn't hear her correctly. So I asked her, I was like, what? And then she repeated it. And then that was the last affirming and meaningful conversation I think that I had in that retreat, because then when things started to become more intense, there wasn't really many efforts to really connect to me or where I was, which I realize is difficult by any accounts, but there really was a lack of communication. I remember feeling a lot of shame coming through the first ceremony was very much shame of shame around being a woman actually and all of this shadow stuff coming through and it felt very cleansing and that didn't really feel beyond like what was normal I think lots of people have shame arise or or go through experiences like that but then what happened was that I had an experience where I lost my sense of self as Martha as an individual mind body person and I felt and I knew that I was part of everything and everyone so I kind of lost that sense of self um, that we need to navigate everyday life and so I was feeling very expanded very blissful a lot of people would see that as kind of the goal that you want to break through and get beyond the self but you're saying that there was something more than just the blissful side to this yeah because what it did in my mind was that I had all of this expanded feeling and I also was left with a total lack of fear because of that. So I I kind of could see everything. I saw everything as a game. I saw everything as a dream. I saw everything as basically being okay. Despite it all, I kind of just felt this profound sense of okayness and that what we understood to be real wasn't as real as it was. And that left me with a a total lack of fear and a lack of respect for social norms. Like I had this trickster energy that came through me that was quite disruptive and didn't really care about protecting the ego. That is what I've realized dictates so much of how we are in groups is about self-preservation and belonging in the group, not wanting to be ostracized. Um, So I just lost that. And being in those kind of states can often be seen and experienced as a mania, as like a manic intrusiveness, someone who's just breaking through all the different niceties of social conventions that we have. When people are in what often is called a manic state, all that's gone. They're just completely disregarding all that. And they become very, very difficult to be around as a result. Yeah, totally raw. And That's what I think leads to, like I was saying at the beginning, potentially dehumanizing and degrading ways of speaking because it is uncomfortable. Rules are being broken, boundaries are being crossed, and that's not necessarily coming from a malicious place from the individual, but maybe because they've just lost the boundary of who they are. So what were some examples of things that you were doing that were breaking boundaries or or making people uncomfortable by your disregard of kind of social protection and social niceties? I did have an exp- I did have a really funny moment where I was in the UK and had smoked some weed and so had kind of gone back into this state and was I was pretend I was in Bristol and I was pretending to be um a cat just in this kind of public it's kind of the underbelly of Bristol it's like the 
a place that's quite creative there's lots of skaters there's lots of graffiti but it's you know it's it's also not somewhere where you'd want to be in a vulnerable state and I have this memory of pretending to be like some kind of cat and just playing with my bag and then I'd like to yeah speak about what it looked like from the outside and then what it looked like from the inside which is very um to do with archetypes and myth and story and and things like that that was very present for me because I felt like my imagination had been turned inside out so for me I was moving through the landscape of my own imagination and if everything was kind of a figment of this dream I didn't see it as a problem if I was being weird and I guess from the outside I mean, I've spoken to my cousin since because my, my cousin was there when all of this was happening. And we've, we've spoken since and she said there were times when I was a little bit mean to her. I was a little bit rude, like, like out of character because I'm, I'm not normally like that. And there was a time when, oh, when I was pretending to be a horse, I was just trotting around apparently. <laughs> um... There was also a time when I was um, collecting herbs and giving people healings, apparently, which I don't remember either. And they, and they were, you know, they were helpful. I gave her a healing, apparently, with some herbs to help her with something specific. And she said that it helped and that it worked. So it's so a really not a black and white experience that, you know, it's, you're either mad or you're, or you're not. I was mad and yet I was able to serve some kind of purpose as well in my own way. So the old Martha personality kind of went away and now you're free, you're fearless, you're open, you're vulnerable, and you're in this imaginary world where you're interacting with all these different archetypes and all these imaginations and you're becoming a horse and you're becoming a herb healer. And it's, it sounds wonderful. What was, what, what was the point in which you got into trouble with it? It was wonderful. I guess how I understand it is that the unconscious material of my psyche that people often see in visions for example with ayahuasca so they might sit down close their eyes and see this kind of stuff I was living that I it was coming through me and I was acting it out not really knowing what what was happening but that's how I really understand it now and so obviously in the psyche there are there might be horses trotting around but there's you know there's also dark parts there's also violence there's also you know those monsters and I, I guess what led me to getting into trouble is when those archetypes came through as well and I didn't have a strong enough observing ego or witness to be um, filtering any of it it was totally unfiltered so what happened you started to be aggressive towards people or were you becoming suicidal or what was happening I think I reached that point where intense experience that can also be quite irritable so I think in people who may have experienced manic states before might recognize this. There's an intensity and there's probably a bit of an obsession with one's own themes. So like maybe I was really interested in, you know, speaking about something that was really present for me and not so interested in being part of more of a collective energy. And so I think I was probably quite annoying to be around. And then when approached, I don't like... Again, my observing ego wasn't really there, but I do remember people approaching me trying to trying to kind of constrain me and I remember lashing out back at them. And I don't know if that was the first time that they tied me up, but they I was tied up for long periods of time. This was in Colombia after the uh, ayahuasca session. The funny thing was they kept giving me ayahuasca. So I was having this response and yet I was still able to keep drinking, which... Now looking back, I think, wow, is that really safe? Like, what's going on there? So the ayahuasca response is overwhelming you, and they're just giving you more ayahuasca. Yeah. <laughs> Why were they doing that? Did they just see that the curative powers of the ayahuasca were going to just solve the situation? They didn't consider that maybe the ayahuasca might be at the limit, that you need to have no more of it? Yeah, I really don't have an answer to that. Um, I'm not sure what was what was the reasoning behind it. And then after these sessions, did you start to have problems with sleep? Since that first time in Colombia, when I shifted from wanting to be an activist to a deeper or a different type of inquiry, I did start to have um, unusual dreams, or, but I wouldn't say that my sleep was ever really disrupted. What was it you were doing that led them to, to tie you up? Because that's a pretty strong thing that they did. That must, and you, you didn't want to be tied up, so they were really, really controlling you there. Yeah, I mean, I remember there were several 
several points at which I was tied up. And the first one that I can remember was that that I was carrying um, a pallet of wood from one place to the other. And I was carrying this like above my head. And I remember it being something to do with strength. And I remember feeling really strong and just wanting to, all I wanted to do was to carry the pallet of wood from here to there. That was the first moment where they thought they should tie me up. But I also have memories of being in quite a calm state and being quite or well, very laid back and then still tying me up. Um, and I remember being tied up and being very calm and just because of the sheer duration of it. And this was like on my front with hands tied to feet. So in, it's, that's quite um, not a particularly comfortable position to be in. But I mean, they were obviously doing what they thought was best. And my cousin has has said to me since it took us like five years to have this conversation because I was I think we were both traumatized by it. But she said, you know, I felt so bad because I really didn't challenge what was happening. And part of me deep down knew that that wasn't what, what was happening wasn't right. Like the way that you're being treated wasn't right. But that power of the collective that when someone's in charge, you kind of you don't question that. So that was really interesting to get her feedback on that. And I guess I've come to a place of cautionary acceptance and forgiveness and good faith that they um, were doing their best. And so you continued to drink the ayahuasca all during this retreat? Yeah, then I was taken to the shaman's house and stayed there for a few days. I was actually detained, I guess, in his house. There was a shed that they kept me in outside for a few days where... There wasn't actually access to a toilet, so they gave me a bowl to do my business in. So there was a part of me that, even though a part of me wasn't present and wasn't able to be fully making sense, there was also a part of me that really was being degraded and was being traumatized by this treatment. And I think that's really important to remember that no matter how crazy someone looks in the moment and that you know it may appear that they really have lost the plot, the body keeps the score and there is a part of our awareness that does keep the score as well. And I was, yeah, deeply traumatized by that, to be honest. So looking back, you really wish that you'd had a different response. And even though you feel a lot of forgiveness and and feel that they were doing the best that they could, it was still wrong what happened to you. I mean, I did work with a psychologist in the UK about this. She really wanted to help me to understand what had happened as traumatic. I arrived to her and to the therapy thinking that I deserved all of that and that it was my fault because I was, you know, behaving in a certain way that deserved to be treated like that. She's done a lot of work with me about seeing what happened as a trauma and that being essential to healing and I think that I, I'm, you know, I'm glad that I did that. I'm glad that I did that therapy. And did the shaman eventually release you from this shed that you were locked in? Yeah, I think I kind of came down enough for them to think, okay, let's let her out now. And I started eating a little bit. Um, I started hanging out um, at the house more where everyone else was. And then eventually my Colombian boyfriend who I was in a long-term relationship with at the time came and collected me I stayed at his house for a little while and was really the care that him and his family gave was actually really lovely and they really they were really sweet and then my then I went back to the UK and worked my dad's farm for a little bit actually and I think I think I dissociated from the from the traumatic parts of that experience and just really came home and wanted to ground my experience so started a meditation practice were you kind of back to baseline in a sense or were you still having these pretty far out kinds of imagination fearless sort of states that you were describing i was having intense dreams and i was meditating quite a lot but i was grounded and back to you know my my folks weren't worried about me at all so in a sense, what happened was you, had, you took a lot of ayahuasca, you had a very strong re- reaction to it, and then you kind of came down as the ayahuasca was kind of wearing off. And Yeah, I did, yeah. But then there were other problems that developed later. Yes. Again, though, induced, I would say, or at least affected by recreational drug use. So in the, in the UK, I think I did some mushrooms. 
and that triggered an episode that triggered a really elated state at a festival that was very joyful and um elated and I had some quite funny beliefs about people being different animals or like seeing like feeling spirit animals and crystals and like all quite light um, stuff. It was a little bit more than you might expect just from taking mushrooms for most people. Your, your friends weren't having these experiences. You were kind of revisiting some of the states that had been opened up. Yeah, absolutely. I was having, a, it was like ayahuasca had kind of opened a doorway that I was passing into, not necessarily intentionally and slipping through slipping through into these states more easily and not really able to come back. And that's really the issue, you know, if I'd been able to come back when I needed to and behave like I was expected to, then that's how you avoid getting hospitalized, isn't it? But it's when you can't, it's when you can't do that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one of the cornerstones of what gets called shamanism really is, is the sense of control over those states that you can use to go in and come out. And also that you have a connection and a recognition. A shaman isn't the wild person who's off out of control doing their thing. They're someone who's respected and honored and seen by the community in that role. So they have that social connection. Maybe control isn't quite the right word, but at least they're navigating. There's a certain element of empowerment or groundedness around it. And that it sounds like you didn't really have that still. So you had this experience at the festival where it opened up again that door, but this time it's more positive, a little bit more euphoric or blissful or fun. And then at what point does it really kind of get into a problem with the mental health system? A few days after this, the festival, or maybe it was a few weeks, I was still not at baseline. I was still kind of elated, I would say, Re- feeling really restless at home in my parents' house, basically feeling really like I just wanted to be going out all the time. And so I went out into town. I think I'd smoked some weed as well. So that was contributing. I was going into these clubs and was in, you know, quite a vulnerable state. I was in imaginary land. So I was experiencing everything as archetypes, everything externally. I was, I was experiencing it as aspects of my own psyche and kind of projecting onto the outer reality, the mythic journey of my own story. And that involved an encounter with this guy in this club who I was projecting onto some kind of identity as some kind of warrior-esque archetype. And I remember thinking like, oh, I should, you know, this person should teach me to fight. This person should be, we should do, we should spar. (laughs) That was, (laughs) that was my um, unfortunate intention when approaching this person who was like a six foot guy in a club, like we should spar. (laughs) And that's basically what I said to him, I think probably in different words. And I, he um, basically ended up, he, he floored me. He knocked me out. Um, he hit me in the face, put my teeth through my lip. And so I remember falling back, into, falling back onto the ground and, um, yeah, then having like leaving the club but then I couldn't rest or sleep so I went back out and I ended up somewhere and I was picking up leaves and the police picked me up and I actually I'd because of what had happened because of having been punched in the face I'd managed to find a hammer and just have that in my bag as some kind of symbolic feeling of protection and safety and so I wasn't doing anything threatening, but when these police officers noticed my unusual behavior, I think I was collecting leaves or something, didn't have any shoes on and stuff like that. They, they searched me and they found what they saw as a weapon and then they arrested me and I spent a night in a cell. So your behavior wasn't dangerous or threatening. You were just being really weird. Yeah. (laughs) I imagine that they kind of thought you were mental and they found this hammer and they think, oh, wow, she's dangerous. So we're going to put her in a cell. Yeah, and then being in a cell made me even weirder. But the police didn't know of your any of your other unusual behaviors at the clubs or anything before that. No, no, I don't think so. They just kind of found me because um no shoes in public. Yeah, and this was like in the early hours as well, and I think they I mean, I think the police bring a lot of people into cells or hospitals actually. They are often the the people on the front lines who are encountering individuals in manic states or in vulnerable states of consciousness. So they brought me in and I don't know how long I spent in the cell, but the isolation and the total lack of human contact really 
pushed me pushed me over the over the edge so then that's how I that's how I came to be in hospital I can't really remember what I was doing in the cell I think I was just I remember really wanting to get out really really wanting to be, not be there I just did not want to be there and I think I was imagining my escape somehow I've I remember like jumping off the bed a few times things like that not being your average prisoner I guess yeah and this is something we see a lot and people are in a, a very unusual state and then there's this response that's a fear response or a controlling response and it just really makes things worse it sounds like that's not what you needed you didn't need to be in that cell I've actually thought about what would be more helpful responses. The the ability to kind of connect to someone or or mirror somehow what or, or seek to kind of connect to their their narrative or what's going on for that person on the inside can be really helpful in a playful way. And working with the content that's coming through, acknowledging that it's material from the unconscious mind that is emerging not this person's personality or their intentions it's unconscious material that is surfacing in order for what can hopefully be a restorative and transformative process so when we shut them down it's like that iatrogenic harm thing it's we're freezing people in these states potentially and stopping the process following through for at least some people's experience anyway and so that response brought you into the mental health system. And then how did you change your whole relationship to all of this? Because you described it as an initiation. You described it as, as your breakthrough into a spiritual process and into something that's actually transformative and positive for you. How did you kind of turn that all around for yourself? I think it started through accepting where I was and where I felt myself to be, which was really at ground zero, feeling like... Um, I had no options. I had no future. I was um, that I'd ruined my life. Funnily enough, there's a letting go of ambition. There's a letting go of egoic drives for status. And what was present in my activism in Colombia, there was definitely ego in that, um, whether I knew it or not. And so there was a real crumbling of egoic structures that were both, you know, whether they had been positive or negative, there had been a crumbling. And so what I managed to do when I was in that crumbled state was thanks to the the meditation experiences before, I kind of saw this as like, hang on, I intuitively know can lead somewhere if I can be humble enough to take the lessons. So it was really just an attitude of wanting to learn, wanting to accept help where it was offered. So when working with a psychologist was offered, I accepted it. When leaning into the diagnosis or the label of psychosis allowed me to you know become co-director of this research thing I accepted that I wasn't pushing away the mental health paradigm but I was also looking beyond and I was doing my own reading I was reading John Weir Perry I was reading Joseph Campbell I was practicing Zen Buddhism I was just trying to like just really act from a place of humility because I, I kind of knew enough about how I was behaving in my manic states to know that There was a definite lack of humility. There were lots of other things that were present, but there was um, a need for me to be on my knees. And that's where ayahuasca had put me, which was on my knees. And I I kind of was able to to see that as, as something that I could handle and that I could, yeah, alchemize somehow. And so how has it benefited you? Because you went through quite an ordeal. I mean, this is complete overturning of your identity and a lot of disruption and then violence also happening to you. How is it that this is beneficial? How do you think this has actually helped you now looking looking back on it all? I think when extreme experiences happen like that, they stretch you. So I feel now my capacity to be compassionate and hold either myself or other people um, has expanded. It's been stretched. So it's kind of difficult to alienate me or shock me with how someone is behaving in terms of patients that I might work with now. But in a more general sense, I think I did some work around archetypes. Like that was a really key, key part, like understanding what was happening what was my narrative around that the way that I've explained what was happening to me as unconscious material coming through and embodying the shadow aspects in a kinesthetic way rather than a visual way like how other people might have their experiences with ayahuasca and how seeing everything as a dream and uh, living the trickster archetype that wasn't given to me I like I, I had to cultivate that 
insight I, that's what I kind of mean so and it's been such a helpful orientation I guess the hero's journey is helpful as well like I used an analogy of my breakdown being like I was just walking along and then I, I fell down a really deep dark hole and it was too deep and too far away for me to just climb out easily or someone to pull me out and rather than just scrambling my way up and struggling and really not accepting that I was in this hole I kind of just stayed in the hole for a bit and I looked around and I I saw what was there and in the end I discovered you know that there were gemstones lodged in the cracks of this scary place and I managed to collect some of them before then climbing my way out and to offer them so it's really about been about contribution more than anything else like how can I use what's happened to me to help others and feeling like if I can somehow use my experiences to give in some way then that's something that continues to have a really positive impact on me. And in all of your encounters with the mental health system, were, were medications ever used? And did you find medications useful or not? Or, or were, what's your relationship to medications now? I'm not on any medication. I was put on some medication that I slowly came off in secret, actually. I respected my parents too much to just do it quickly or in front of them. I didn't want to freak them out. And so I did it slowly in secret. And it was so funny because I had felt in myself that my soul was really being dampened and squashed in some way or or really restricted by these medications. I felt that and I felt the blunting effects and it felt like my soul was dying. And then when I started to come off them, I didn't say anything to my parents, but they said like, hey, what's going on with you? Like, you've got your smile back, your back, like what's happened? And I was like, and then I told them and then they they said, wow, well, if, you know, has been your experience and then we, we support you coming off them. And looking back on this experience that you went through and, and also getting a, a sense, you know, where you are now, what, what kind of advice or, or guidance would you share with somebody who's maybe going through something really difficult now, or maybe someone who's considering doing psychedelics or doing ayahuasca, or maybe who is really interested in spiritual practice. What are some of the key lessons that you think you bring back from this? I think connection is a really key lesson. You know, if it wasn't for my friends, still being my friends through having been in hospital, I don't think I would have survived And so it can feel really lonely when you've gone through something like this. And so I would say like really nurturing the connections um, that you have and realizing how important they are, whether that's before you go and do psychedelics and making sure, you know, there's, there's people around you that you would feel safe with if you were to go in and into an extreme state, or if you've already been through that, then really investing in finding out who it is that you feel safe with and being able to talk stuff through and also holding hope for yourself that, like you said at the beginning, we get what we're ready for. And it may really not feel like that at the time, just holding at least the possibility that this may be in some way an opportunity for some kind of growth process or something that could actually show you just how strong you are because you've survived it. And that's not to enforce any type of new transformation model into anyone's lives. Like you've got to be really delicate when using experiences that are mine or subjective and applying them to other people's. Um, I just think that we need in services at least to hold space for the fact that some people do go through intense crises and come out the other end better and not just better, but deeply impacted in in a positive way. And that's just so alien to what you find in mental health services at the moment. Beautiful. Martha, I want to come back to something you said before about, you know, is it psychosis or is it a spiritual emergence? And we're in agreement, I feel that, you know, that you have to blur these things that we can't just diagnose one or the other. And then that's it. How do we bring that approach into mental health services? How do we have more of an opening to no matter what you're going through, no matter how crazy or hard or even violent it may seem on the outside, that there may always be this potential for spiritual growth and learning and even shamanic initiation. How do we bring that perspective in in an effective and useful way into mental health 
services and, and practice as, as clinicians and as a mental health system? It's such a good question. And I think it's about looking at where we are now, which um, at least in my work and in the field and the area where I live is that we're moving from purely medical approach to really bringing in trauma-informed care. That is a really important step. So understanding adverse childhood experiences and how these go on to affect people and trauma-informed care is also more about narrative and compassion and understanding But I think one of the potential limitations is that it very much places people in the victim role and doesn't necessarily give them a way out of that. Yeah, the trauma framework is still kind of medical in a sense that, you know, you you, instead of saying what's wrong with you, we say what happened to you, but it's still like a negative thing. It's still like there's something broken or injured or wounded or lower that you become kind of a victim in a sense. Exactly. And it's important because we're moving away from pointing at the individual's brain as the problem to maybe pointing to social factors, system problems, societal issues. And that's a really needed step. But somehow, I think from moving from that trauma informed care, the way that we can bring in the possibility for transformation is through looking at what's known as post traumatic growth that has traditionally been applied to physical traumas, so warfare or maybe cancer diagnosis or something experienced as traumatic. And the study of how people who've gone through something awful have actually found it to be somehow beneficial. If we understand psychosis or extreme states to be traumatic and yet therefore there to be a possibility of growth as a result of that trauma, then maybe that's how we could introduce it in a grounded way that won't alienate clinicians who don't identify as spiritual or who don't have a spiritual practice. Martha Sneed, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Will. You've been listening to an interview with Martha Sneed. Martha works in the National Health Service in the UK as a frontline mental health carer. She survived a psychotic breakdown after a journey with the psychedelic drug ayahuasca. And today she is co-director of an interdisciplinary research team in Bristol, UK, and is studying transpersonal psychology and consciousness studies. You can contact Martha at martha11.06.90 at gmail.com. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio host is Will Hall. Producer is Nina Packabush. Madness Radio is an affiliate of Madden America Radio, broadcasting on KBOO in Oregon, sponsored by Portland Hearing Voices and The Icarus Project, and syndicated on the Pacifica Network. Madness Radio is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio and at madnamerica.com. <laughs>